Rejoice, because Angular is dead. <laughs> kind of. Angular is changing a lot, and in its changes, it's fusing with another framework that you probably haven't heard of called Wiz. What the hell is Wiz? Well, we're going to have to dig in quite a bit to understand what's going on here, because as per usual, the world of Angular is both really simple and strangely chaotic. Today, the ng-conf keynote occurred, where they announced this huge change. This is a tweet thread from Sarah Drasner, who's over on the Angular side of things, and she's been one of the most talented and useful resources in the web dev world for a long time. So when I saw her tweet this, I knew we had to dig in. Today, we have some exciting news. We're merging frameworks, Angular and Wiz. The keynote addressing the changes is linked here. We'll take a look in a bit. Don't worry. First, I want to go through this thread and showcase a few other cool things I've found. Some of you might know that we used a few frameworks at Google that power our apps. Most notably, Angular is the most used in a framework called Wiz that powers Search, Workspaces, and YouTube. YouTube's also powered by Polymer. It's an interesting mess. We'll get there, don't worry. Wiz has some innovative approaches to performance, some concepts like resumability. As the web calls for richer and richer experiences, but also performance and latency guarantees, we notice that these frameworks, which historically serve different use cases, actually have strengths that could be shared. Merging two frameworks is complex, as you might imagine, but this work is already underway. Angular signals, as you've seen them thus far, are actually powering Wiz already, as well as properties like YouTube. It's pretty crazy to think that Angular signals are being used on YouTube right now, where you guys are watching this video. In fact, when I tell you to please subscribe, you might notice that button is lighting up underneath my video where the subscribe button's located. That probably was a signal. And if you want to appreciate the signal and maybe trigger a few more, you can click that button and you'll see other things change too. Pretty cool, right? That's all powered by signals and kind of inspired by the solid push to move us in that direction. Really exciting. On the other side, you'll start to see impressive improvements to Angular's performance as it gleans from Wiz. This is also exciting because Angular is not the fastest framework, but if it can learn things from Wiz, that's very exciting. I couldn't be more proud of these teams, not just for the incredible work, but also how willing they've been to collaborate, learn, and listen from one another. We couldn't have done this without thoughtful and open team members. So grateful for them. As a shout out to all the people who were involved that are on Twitter and also so many more. Cool crew. Oh shit, Adi Osmani showed up for this too. I think this is the right call for both frameworks. It sets the futures up well for success. Totally agree. This is not the only thing going on in the Angular world and I feel obligated to showcase a few of the other cool things going on before we go dive more into this Wiz stuff. In my opinion, most of the future of Angular is being carried largely by Brandon Roberts. Brandon is not an employee at Google working on the framework directly. Brandon is actually working at OpenSauce, which is an open source company building better tools for insights on open source repositories. Brandon's pushed for a lot of awesome things in the Angular ecosystem, but without question, the most important one is Analog.js, which is the equivalent of something like Next for Angular, where you can do good server-side rendering, have meaningful primitives binding things from the back end and the front end, and just have a good experience building real full-stack applications. I've been really impressed with what Brandon's done with Analog, especially when you consider that this has been largely a solo effort. He has been killing it, and they just hit their 1.0, less than a week ago. So if you are actually interested in Angular and somehow haven't played with Analog and all the cool work that he's doing, huge shout out to him. He's also been proposing new ways to do syntax for component definitions that has gotten a lot of pushback from the Angular community. But as a person who hasn't been very fond of Angular, what he's doing is enticing enough that I actually pay attention to it. And without question, Brandon's my favorite person from the Angular community. I'll be sure to leave his Twitter in the description so you can take a look at his stuff if you're curious as well. Sadly, we're not here to talk about server-side rendering. We're much more focused on what they're doing here. I want to hear a bit from this keynote, so let's do some skimming. If you want to hear this full keynote, I'll be sure to link that in the description as well, because we'll be skimming through just trying to find some important highlights. So uh, most of you may not know this, but inside of Google, we have one more framework called Wiz. Wiz is not an open source framework. It is internal to Google, and it is also very tightly coupled to the internal Google tech stack. It is also very different compared to what you're used to from the open source community. Wiz is also hyper-focused on performance above all else, and uh, this is why many Google flagship products are using Wiz, such as Google Search, Google Meet, Photos, Google Play, and yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that he brings up Google Photos because of a wonderful tweet we found earlier, which is when Malta, who if you guys don't know Malta somehow, he's the CTO of Vercel now. He used to work at Google and was really involved in a lot of these types of decisions. And a big part of why they didn't put out Wiz is they didn't think there was a demand for it. And he calls that out here. View source on e.g. Google Photos and look for JS controller and JS action attributes. We decided not to open source it many years ago, mostly because I misread the market for how useful it would be. This is a crazy tweet to call out so directly that you didn't think there was a demand for this. So that's why it wasn't open sourced. Very interesting. So I think that's useful context as we go further. 
Angular and Wiz have both existed in some form for over 10 years. And in the beginning, the types of UI that developers would build with them were a bit different. Wiz applications tended to be more consumer focused, especially for products that were extremely latency sensitive. And Angular applications tended to be more kind of highly interactive, a lot of overlap with what people would commonly call enterprise or business focused UIs. I like the self-awareness where they're calling Angular more enterprise because I've never seen a more true statement come from the Angular team than saying that Angular is more for enterprise use cases. Because yeah, having a built-in framework solution to every problem, most of the time that isn't ideal, but at least is there, is great when you have a giant code base that's been maintained for over 10 years. It works really well for that. As much as I love the flexibility of React, I understand that without a certain level of dedication from a certain number of devs at your company, that the variety and solutions to problems can quickly reach a chaotic point. And with Angular, that's a little harder to get to. The quality ceiling that you can get with Angular is a lot lower than with other frameworks, but the quality floor, especially for the code base, is pretty strongly held. Started noticing the lines between these two different types of UIs, they started to blur. Google developers working with Wiz wanted more features like Angular. And Google developers working with Angular wanted more features like Wiz. And that was not only Googlers, but also developers in the community. So it became clear that these two different frameworks were actually converging on very similar ideas. And people at Google were asking, why are we duplicating so much work? And so last year, the stars aligned, and we struck upon some serendipity. Just as we were looking to build our signal primitives for Angular, Wiz was looking at doing the exact same thing. And we were able to say, I, I have to make an AI joke here. My guess is that they tried to run a Gemini image generation where they had a bunch of stars in the shape of the Angular logo. And what they ended up with instead was this. So they had to change the copy. No, I thought that was a good joke. I'm sorry I had to. What if we shared? And even better, there was a product team that was super enthusiastic to collaborate with both Angular and Wiz on these shared signal primitives to get an initial version running in production on a pretty aggressive timeline. This is something I don't actually expect from Google. And I want to give a huge shout out to them for doing this because I want this to be the norm at every company of every size. Bold problems aren't solved by writing documentation about how to solve them for three years before doing anything. Bold problems are solved by trying your damnedest to make something work. And once you've got something kind of working, learn from that. But the starting point for a big thing like this, like merging two frameworks, the starting point isn't a proposal document that took 10 people multiple years to write. The starting point is someone making it work, figuring out what doesn't doesn't work, and then planning around that instead. So it's really cool to see Google embracing that type of more greenfield, go in heads first approach to development, because that's the only way you can actually make big, bold changes. And that one line that was just said here has given me much more confidence that this might actually go somewhere. I also want to call out that the color flickering on the side here for once isn't my screen capture, it's theirs. So that makes me feel a lot better because it's even flickering on my laptop. Anyways initial version running in production on a pretty aggressive timeline. So this must have been some pretty small product, right? Well, I think some of you may have heard of it. Today, Angular Signals primitives are in production for 100% of YouTube mobile web traffic. Mobile web. I was holding my breath there, and then he said mobile web. And it's like, oh, OK. So the website that's goal is to upsell you to the mobile app. OK. I'll admit I'm guilty of this too. I regularly point out that Twitch uses Next.js as one of the first Next.js users, but they only use it for the mobile site, which exists almost entirely as an upsell of the mobile app. So fair. It's just funny to see a company of Google size put the YouTube logo here as like, look, we're using YouTube with Angular now when they really mean the mobile site, which is a very small percentage of their traffic and is mostly used to upsell their app, which is built with entirely different tech or their desktop site, which is built with entirely different tech. Theoretically, they might move this to the desktop site probably even have already. But that means when you click my subscribe button below, it might not actually be using those angular signals. But if you don't mind, you should click it anyways. And <laughs> and to dig more in this, we would like to introduce you to Christopher Rocco from YouTube. <laughs> angular and Wiz on the development and adoption of signals for the better part of a year now. And we're currently in the midst of one of our largest ever migrations uh, to Wiz's new reactive rendering system, which is entirely built around 
angular signals. Uh, and to put that into perspective, so YouTube supports three main web platforms today, several apps within each. So we have Living Room, and this is what runs on your smart TVs, game consoles, et cetera. This is actually running in a browser that we built in-house and serves as like a native app. This is actually a really interesting point that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. Most TV apps like Netflix, Twitch, what they're describing here with YouTube, usually those are going to be browser based because making a custom UI for every platform from like Roku to LG's WebOS shit to, I don't know, Apple TV even is incredibly difficult, especially when you want to roll out a new feature. Like when the watch later playlists get rolled out or chapters and videos get rolled out, how do you make that appear on someone's LG TV from seven years ago? It's difficult. And a part of big part of how they do that is using web primitives instead. Because again, I talk about this a lot, shipping native applications to most platforms makes consistency across your platform significantly harder. If you want to update your API to do things slightly differently, but you have a thousand users that are on a version of your app from six years ago, as soon as you make that change, the app dies. And now imagine a company like Netflix that was maintaining the Wii app for their service for how long was the Wii app for Netflix around? When did Netflix Wii app die? 2019. Think about that. You could still use a Nintendo Wii in full 480p SD glory with the disc Netflix would ship to put into it, which couldn't be updated because it was a literal disc. And they had to support that till 2019. That means any APIs that this Wii version expected had to still be there until they decided to deprecate the Wii service entirely. This is why being able to update things through stuff like JavaScript is so useful because it lets you not worry about these types of deprecations and have a more consistent platform overall. This future gets even more exciting when you consider things like React Native, which let you not have to render a web shell. Instead, you're using JavaScript that is served from some external source to render the correct native stuff, which the future with React Native is very exciting for these reasons. But at this point in time, this is reality and it probably should stay that way for a while because it's important to keep your platforms consistent and it's hard to do this without web tools. Although the point you just made that they invented a browser for this is actually really interesting. Uh, then we also have a very full featured mobile web application that like uh, Living Room serves as a native app for a class of low cost phones with browser based operating systems, often our emerging markets like India. And then of course we have our desktop apps, which includes a massive suite of creator tools. And today, each of these platforms handles rendering different. He made a good point about the mobile web stuff too that I probably should reference more, which uh, you can't even really see because my face is in the way, I'll move that. And the mobile web examples here, those aren't smartphones. That's not Android and iOS. Those are feature phones. And one of those, that's KaiOS, right? Yeah, KaiOS is an interesting enough operating system. I could probably do a whole video about it. The history of it is insane. It originally forked out of Firefox OS. It was a mobile Linux distribution for keypad feature phones. So like the phones with the little buttons that you can install like some apps, but not many on. It also has a web browser that actually works because it was forked from Firefox OS, which obviously Firefox is a browser that mostly works. So it makes sense that if they made an operating system that the browser would work. The goal of Firefox OS and as such, KaiOS, was to make it possible to do a decent mobile experience and build decent mobile apps using web technologies. So things like a mobile website could be opened and used meaningfully on one of these devices that supports 4G is just a 20 to $30 phone that has way slower everything. It isn't a real OS, but you can still do stuff with it. Like as of the 1st of April 2020, there was over 500 apps in the Kai store. I'm sure it's significantly more since then. These phones are really popular in emerging marketplaces. And when you have a good mobile site, it actually works well. And if you want to target the regions where this stuff is popular, you need a mobile site that works. Also, the TCL callouts fascinating. Uh, TCL has slowly taken over manufacturing of basically anything with a screen. If you're interested in that, let me know and I'll make a second channel video about it because I know way too much about the TCL and the history of manufacturing panels. Fun fact, TCL owns BlackBerry now. Anyways. Go away. So performance is a never ending battle. We spend a lot of time on it. We're still not where we'd like to be and rendering is an important part of that. Uh, so first, the signals meet the prerequisites of each of our platforms. You know, they have universal browser support. If your browser supports arrays and closures, it'll support Angular signals. Uh, this is necessary for the custom browser we use to power living room. And two, the bundle size is tiny. It's less than half the size of our virtual. Interesting that all you need for Angular signals is arrays and closures. Very interesting. Virtual DOM approaches, which is perfect for mobile web, where most of our users have slow internet connections. And signals excel at you know, every synthetic benchmark that we could come up with. 
Okay. Uh, opinions. How bad can your bandwidth be if you're using YouTube? Like, how beneficial is it to go from 100 kilobytes of JS to 80 kilobytes of JS if you have to load megabytes of video anyways? I agree for a lot of situations, small bundle size is very important. But when it comes to services where the use of the service requires a large amount of bandwidth, that's a little harder for me to, to swallow. I will say that small bundle size in terms of how much JS the client has to load and understand, that's beneficial. Let's hear what they have to say about the synthetic benchmarks here, though, because I'm curious. Uh, so with that, we kicked off some projects to answer the bigger questions. You know, we wanted to know if the performance gains of signals were scalable to large and inevitably messy code bases and stable over time. That is, you know, once the code is written, how easy is it to regress as various developers are touching that over time? That's an important point with signals. I'll be honest, there just have not been many projects using modern signals best practices for us to understand, like, how do these things scale? And sure, those big Angular code bases have had issues, but they're not that bad. Even in React code bases, I've seen those scale way further than they probably even should. And the biggest bottleneck often ends up being the TypeScript compiler, not the React code itself. And there's a lot of things you can do to make React behave better in large code bases. So we've seen these things scale. We've absolutely seen the composability model of React scale. We haven't seen these new signal best practices scale yet. I'm not saying they can't, to be very clear. I'm just saying that I personally don't like to be the person betting a big project or code base on an unproven thing. And that's an important thing that they're calling out here is they don't actually know over time what maintaining these things looks like. Because when you build a graph of your data flow instead of a graph of your UI, and then you bind that data flow graph to your UI graph, things get a little a little more chaotic. I diagram this a bit in my video about the view vapor changes. So check that out if you want to hear me go a little more in depth on how these types of update flows work, or just read any of Ryan Carniota's blog posts because he's much smarter about this stuff than me. The point I'm trying to make is that signals have their own separate set of unintuitive behaviors that we have to account for, and I don't know if those patterns scale just yet. React has foot guns, but those foot guns don't seem to keep your code base from scaling to lots of engineers. Oh boy, demo. Let's see this. So 35 on our low end better devices, latency. we saw you know, 35% improvement on interaction latency on living room as you're navigating through video tiles. On our video player controls, we were able to bring all of our key interactions up to a smooth 60 frames per second. That's a huge win. That's a massive win. What? I did not expect that to be like a 2x plus. Like skimming and video scrubbing is an incredibly difficult problem. And my gut feel before would have been that this was like an encoding issue, not just a, a JS issue. The fact that you could solve that in JavaScript is actually kind of insane to me. Okay, you, you have my attention, sir. Uh, with very little effort, often up from a jittery 25. On Did he say second, very little effort there? I, I want to hear what he has to say there again. Our video player controls, we were able to bring all of our key interactions up to a smooth 60 frames per second uh, with very little effort, often up from a jittery 25. On our shorts carousel, just swiping through videos, we also achieved 60 frames per second, lower interaction latency, and this meaningfully increased our top line metrics like views and watch time. Interesting. I'm scared to think how much JavaScript they're using to define those interactions. I would try to defer as much of that to like CSS once triggered. It's fascinating that they got that type of win. I am way more excited now. Performance by default. That's a bold promise. That's a real bold promise. But I'm curious to see how this goes for them. And if you want to learn more about why video skimming and stopping at a specific point of video is hard beyond the JavaScript side, I have a whole video about compression and H.264 that did not get the attention it deserves. I'll be sure to link that in the description as well. Yeah, if anybody wants an easy way to like get noticed in the tech space, there is an open market right now for downloading these important conference talks that have things fucked up about them. Like maybe the pacing is bad. Maybe the audio sucks, those types of things. Just tidying it up a little bit and throwing it on some channel. It's like tech archive or something. And just take these moments. Like this one has like 40 plus minutes of nothing at the beginning. Delete all that shit. Trim whatever the hell's going on here. Cut straight to when it actually starts. Tidy up the audio a little bit. Delete the parts where they're like transferring between things. And you could have a channel that's the actual most watchable version of these things. I don't know how much money you could actually make from ad rev. I'm sure some people are going to get mad about copyright shit. It's worth trying. If you get copyright struck for it, you just take it down or make sure you leave a little email like in your description. Everyone's like, by the way, if you want this taken down, hit me up here and I'll do it. The point here isn't that you're going to make a ton of money remonetizing other people's content. I wouldn't even 
like make this ad rev generating. I wouldn't even turn monetization on necessarily, but simply as a way to showcase to the tech world that you specifically know how to make watchable content out of less watchable content. You now have a point of reference to prove to basically any one company or person in the industry that you know how to fix video when it's not going well. That's a great in for a job. Just a, a thing to consider if you're an individual that's watching this, that's trying to break into the industry, that's into video enough to want to do something like that. Just one of many examples of something you could do to break in because these guys clearly don't know, at least the people who are running this and put this on YouTube don't know how to make a watchable video, which is fine. They're engineers and they're showcasing really cool engineering things, but it could be more watchable. One more important call out from Sarah, because I know I'm going to be accused for clickbaiting here and I want to give them my fair shake. They consider this the opposite of killing Angular. This is them investing more deeply and merging with Wiz means more emphasis on Angular. And again, a lot of Google's most important products aren't using Angular, they're using Wiz. And as such, merging these things together means there's more reason for Google to invest in Angular, whereas right now it just kind of exists and is used by some stuff. Now there's reason not only for it to exist, but for it to continue improving and being invested in as a whole. Alternative angle is that now YouTube has to use Angular. So uh, if you're looking to poach YouTube engineers, you might have the opportunity. <laughs> I think that's all I have to say about Angular this time. It's actually really exciting news. It's cool seeing frameworks that you don't associate with lots of change making these big, bold moves. I knew when they initially announced signals that things were going to start changing. I would never have guessed this though. So huge shout out again to the Angular community. I did not expect to have more to talk about here, but it is really cool to watch. And I hope that we can continue learning from all the crazy stuff y'all do. Thank you guys as always. Until next time. Peace, nerds.